Hi, everyone, and welcome back. We are talking about the Joy Luck Club, the book, not the movie. Um, and this is the third lecture in a four lecture series on themes. So lecture one, I looked at the structure and some of the characters in the book. The second lecture focused on the historical background of the Second Sino-Japanese War, which is the setting for a lot of the women's stories. And now we're going to look at some of the themes in the book. I did not list all of them here. I think that this book is really rich in terms of of themes and even some symbolism. The characterization is quite intricate. Some of the things we're going to be talking about in class, but I wanted to talk about some of the larger themes here. And then next lecture, I'm going to uh, do a face-to-face -face talk with you about the um, literary traditions and literary movements of American literature and how this book fits in. So let's get started. Storytelling, folk tales, and superstitions. Um, these are some superstitions about Chinese New Year, decor for prosperity, no prepare auspicious food, no porridge, no sweeping or dusting. Um, I talked a little bit before about the storytelling. The novel, again, there are four sections of four stories each. They're narrated in turn by one of the novel's um, seven narrators, although there are eight main characters. I kind of made a little mistake there. Um, but within those narratives, the women sometimes tell, like maybe they'll be in 1980 and they'll be talking to their daughter and they'll tell their daughter something that happened back in 1930, right? There's a lot of nested narratives um, and things embedded within each of these stories. But many of the stories also, particularly those of the mothers, the, the women who form this club called the Joy Luck Club, they mimic Chinese oral traditions. They really are trying not just to convey their experiences, but they're trying to convey Chinese culture to these daughters who have really, they're completely, or at least partially, they're, in their mother's eyes, they're completely Americanized. So they weave together folk tales, sometimes superstitions. Um, in one scene, we have a mother saying to her daughter that she hasn't eaten all her rice noodles, and that's going to show the kind of husband she's going to marry. Um, those types of things are, are woven throughout the story. Storytelling is the way in which the mothers convey their experiences, but again, also the wisdom to their daughters. Unfortunately, there are also some difficulties in telling these stories. So we have tensions or conflict, miscommunication, and a lot of cultural differences between the mothers and their children. How can a 30-year-old woman in 1989 understand why um, her grandmother would have entered into a polygamous marriage where she was a fourth wife, right? How could a um, mother <laughs> who has come from a background where um, children are supposed to really study hard not understand why her daughter doesn't want to be a prodigy? So, those are some of the things that come up, but the the telling, the miscommunication, um, but also the points of connection and how the stories keep these friendships alive and and keep families, um, the memory of families from from these people that they have lost in China and also some of their cultural traditions as well. So here is a short excerpt. Um, Wang Tai Tai looked impatient as I began to cry softly again. But then the servant left the room with our candle and a big wind came and blew the candle out and our ancestors became very angry. They shouted that the marriage was doomed. They said that Tai Yun's end of the candle had blown out. Our ancestors said that Tai and Yu would die if he stayed in this marriage. So this is um, one of the women in the Joy Luck Club trying as a young girl to get out of an arranged marriage. 
And she's using this idea of superstition to get her way. Um, so they have a candle lit at two ends, and it's supposed to burn through um, the first night as the, the couple is together. So look for little bits of things like this here and there. Where are there superstitions? Um, where are there some, some belief in old folk tales? And how do the mothers use these folk tales or use these superstitions to kind of keep their culture alive in the United States? Mothers and daughters, it should be pretty obvious by now that this is a major theme in the book. Um, I picked this picture. There was an, a couple years ago, a book called Tiger Mom and um, a memoir about tough love parenting that, that really was quite controversial. We're going to see some of the tough love parenting in this book and the um, girls who are essentially American teenagers not really understanding why their, their mothers are behaving in this way. Although the women in the Joy Luck Club, many of them have sons as well as daughters, the book really focuses on relationships between women. Now, I mentioned before that I forgot to put in friendship here, but the, the friendships between the daughters such as they are, and the friendships between the mothers, we see kind of in between things. Um, really, the focus is on family more so. But look for both the relationships between women. The love, bonds, um, stories, miscommunications, and tensions over generational differences all occur between the mothers and their daughters. We also see some of the sacrifices that the mothers are making and some of the sacrifices that the daughters are making too, although that may not be as obvious. Um, the struggles that the mothers go through to be good parents, given the traumas they face in the past, sometimes they feel like they're doing what's best and certain women feel like they're maybe not doing the best that they could do to, um, to parent their children as well as the struggles that the daughters undergo. They attempt to live up to their mother's expectations. Um, many of them are sort of trying to be like their mothers, but also forming their own identities. So I think, again, it's kind of interesting. We see the daughters when they are younger, and then we see them again right at this precipice of, I would say, I think by that point, they're about 30, 25, 30 years old, around there. And um, at that point, really trying to um, involve their mothers in their lives, but as adults and, and, you know, the struggles sometimes that adult children have to hold on to those traditions, but also to, to find themselves and to be themselves, find their own identities. So here's something uh, from Jing Mei, um, also named June. Her, as I said in the beginning, her mother has, um, sorry, her mother has passed away at the beginning of the book, which sort of sets off these events. Now she's looking at the table filled with these other women who make up the Joy Luck Club. What will I say to these other women in the Joy Luck Club? What can I tell them about my mother? I don't know anything. This is what she says. The aunties, the, the, the other women in the Joy Luck Club, the aunties are looking at me as if I had become crazy right before their eyes. And then it occurs to me. They are frightened. In me, they see their own daughters just as ignorant. They see daughters who grow impatient when their mothers talk in Chinese, who will bear grandchildren born without any connecting hope passed from generation to generation. Now, in this excerpt, you can see a few things, um, the differences between the old generation and the new generation, the, the cultural differences between the Chinese and the American, the idea that at least for June, how, how well can you know another person? She Did she know her mother or did she just think that she did? Did she not have enough time as an adult to really get those stories? The other thing to know is that Amy Tan... Um, 
really talks, there's another clip I'm going to be giving you guys if you're in my class, but Amy Fictan has talked about how many of the incidents here, many of the people were inspired by um, things in her life. So her own relationship and her mother with her mother being kind of tenuous, I think is reflected in this. So the generational and cultural conflict that I've been talking about, um, here is another clip here from Lindo, another excerpt. I wanted my children to have the best combination, American circumstances and Chinese character. How could I know these two things do not mix? I taught my daughter how American circumstances work. If you are born poor here, it's no lasting shame. In America, nobody says you have to keep the circumstances somebody gives you. She learned these things, but I couldn't tell her about Chinese character. How to not show your own thoughts. To put your feelings behind your face so you can take advantage of hidden opportunities. Why Chinese thinking is best. I think that this is a great example of um, the generational and cultural conflict really are tied together here. And she's tried to teach her daughter about the advantages of being an American, but she feels like she has possibly failed her in teaching her about the advantages to being Chinese and that maybe her daughter doesn't fully appreciate that. That really is the fear for a lot of these women. As I told you in the second lecture in the historical background, when, when, the Sino-Japanese War occurred, many people, millions of people were displaced from their homes. There was flooding um, due to intentionally breaking dams. Um, they were driven out by the Japanese. Later on, some of them were driven out by the communists. And the women here, the older women, the women of the Joy Luck Club, have undergone immense trauma. Also in Japanese, or I'm sorry, in Chinese culture, home and family and and place was quite important and they've lost that and it if they had come here willingly it might have been different but really coming to the united states under those types of circumstances um made them probably want to grasp onto that culture even more and yet their daughters really don't fully understand that and and therefore the mothers feel like they're not as valued um their history their traditions and and really their lives you know they don't feel as valued as people because this is such a big part of their identity marriage is another theme here but really um i've gone back and fixed it <laughs> marriage and gender roles is really what i wanted to have we have um that is a Japan, or I'm sorry, that is a Chinese wedding um, from 1940s um, after these conflicts took place, most likely, or possibly before. At any rate, what we have in a number of these stories are the gender roles and expectations placed upon the women. And it's interesting to see what the expectations are for the mothers when they are living in China and sometimes their mothers as well, so the grandmothers of the stories, and also how those change for some of the women when they come to the United States, what their expectations are, what their gender roles are um, in terms of who they marry and how they are treated. But to be honest with you, the men, for the most part, are in the background. They play a part in some of the stories, but they're not central. <laughs> they're not the, at the center of this book. At the center of this book really are these women and their relationships with each other as friends, as parents, um, with the grandparents. A lot of times the mothers, again, are talked about, not so much the fathers. So... We do, though, have um, a lot of interesting looks at people's marriages, and here is one of them. This is from Lena. I was mad at Harold, and he was exasperated with me. This morning, before we picked my mother up, he said, you should pay for the exterminators because Miraguay is your cat, so they're your fleas. It's only fair. 
None of our friends could ever believe we fight over something as stupid as fleas. But they also would never believe that our problems are much, much deeper than that. So deep, I don't even know where the bottom is. And now that my mother is here, we have to pretend that nothing is the matter. So there are, just as there are questions about how well can a daughter know her mother, how well can a mother know her daughter, there are also questions about what actually goes on in a marriage and how can um, anybody really fully understand a relationship between two people. And there's a lot here with Lena. Um, Harold is the, the head of the company that it was originally her idea. They have their finances separate. They're, he believes that that's equal. She believes it's not a partnership, but neither she's not really expressing that to him. So there's quite a bit in terms of the, the roles of women in a marriage and what makes a happy marriage. And again, that larger idea of family, what makes a good family and what makes a happy family. Immigration and identity. Again, these women have come to the United States from um, China during this very difficult point in time. But it also affects their daughters. And there's a lot of identity in terms of Chinese culture that um, sometimes the daughters don't understand, but other times outsiders don't fully understand it either. And I think we're invited in as readers, if this is not your culture, you're invited in to kind of have an understanding of what these people's lives are like. So diversity being quite important in American literature at this time. So here is Rick and, uh, and we have Waverly talking about Rich. They are having dinner with her family. When I offered Rich a fork, he insisted on using the slippery ivory chopsticks. He held them splayed like knock-kneed legs of an ostrich while picking up a large chunk of sauce-coated eggplant. Halfway between his plate and his open mouth, the chunk fell on his crisp white shirt and slid into his crotch. And then he helped himself to big portions of the shrimp and snow peas, not realizing he should have taken only a polite spoonful until everybody had a morsel. So I like this scene a little bit lighter um, uh, look at the experience of someone else entering this world and really having no clue what the rules are. Um, Waverly, being a second generation Chinese American, has grown up with these rules, so she kind of straddles in between the Chinese traditions and the American traditions, but uh, is embarrassed for Rich, her boyfriend. <laughs> Here, as he has dinner with the family in the completely wrong way and she's just hoping that he'll be accepted and that everything will be all right so um the the idea of identity who each of these women are how they become the way that they are either through immigrating or from um being children of immigrants is is really the a key piece to this story um and I, I think that this is an, a nice lighter moment. There are darker moments or more dramatic moments as well. But um, that's the other thing too. The, the, this book in terms of tone, because it has so many different stories, it, you really get the full run of emotions. So this is just kind of a nice little piece here. So things to consider while you read. There's our author, Amy Tan, as she looks uh, today. Consider these perspectives, as I just was talking about, of each one of the women. Um, the daughters might see their mothers in one light as harsh or distant, but they also don't really have a full grasp of what their mothers went through um, or how their mothers view the situations that they're describing. Think about what's between the stories, what's said and what's left unsaid, how the women have different perspectives on the events that are occurring and, and what's told, but also what's left out. There are quite a you know number of gaps because... It is told almost in vignettes. So 
we don't have, you know, exactly the route that someone took from China to the United States, how they came into San Francisco, where they decided to live near each other. We don't have everything. Um, there are some gaps, but I think what's what's told is what's important. And also how the author weaves the themes together. I hope you got this while I'm talking, but it's not just like one section is about mothers and here's another chapter and the focus of that is storytelling and another chapter is about generational issues. They, the book is a lot more intricate than that. And as the stories are embedded and nested together, the themes really are woven together as well. So how do these themes of um, generational clashes, immigration, identity, motherhood, family, gender roles, how do they really interact and relate to each other? What I mean by that is, for example, one of the daughters is going through a divorce. Her mother's perspective on that of what the gender roles are in this relationship, what she hopes that they could be, how the marriage might be fixed, um, the expectations that her parents had for her when she was married, right? You can see just in that one example, there, there's more than one thing going on. So I hope that you enjoy this book. It is a great read. It is, to me, it's fascinating. I love the structure. And because of the way it's structured, um, it's not boring. <laughs> if you don't like one character, you might like the next and the next chapter. So next time, the final lecture, um, again, I'm going to be talking about some of the literary movements and how this book fits in. And that is it. I can't wait to see your thoughts about this book. I'm excited to share it with you. Thanks, everybody.